for many reasons. Um, it's my first time in Rio de Janeiro, and it's also the opportunity to see again Boyan, who is, uh, um, of course, a very good mathematician, but uh, is also an old friend. I think we met for the first time in many years ago, in 2000s, in Stockholm. And uh, then we have met several times over. And then it's for the first time that I meet personally Eduardo, who is uh, also um, a, very, a very good and strong expert in regularity theory. We have Skyped several times before, but we never met personally. So it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And also, uh, it's a pleasure to be at IMPA, which is a very prestigious institute, which is very known worldwide. Um, so, as uh, Eduardo was saying, uh, this is the first of a uh, three lectures course, and um, my aim is to give a few basic results from what I would call nonlinear Calder and Zygmunt theory. Uh, so, nonlinear because this is in some sense aimed at showing uh, a bunch of results that are aimed to build a nonlinear counterpart of the classical um, Calder and Zygmunt theory, which is very well known to most of experts, it, at least linear PDs, but also nonlinear ones. Uh, so there are three lectures, and I'll uh, try to give uh, a rather comprehensive uh, summary of, the, of some of the basic results that actually started um, 20 years ago. But so we have seen in the last, in the last year a um, uh, rather um, renewed interest because of uh, several theorems that have been proved over the last, in the last times. OK, let me start by the classics, because it's always nice to start by the classics. So let me recall the classical linear Calder and Zygmunt theory. Uh, and of course, let me start by the most basic example we can think about, and that's the Poisson equation. So uh, essentially, you are prescribing where the Laplacian is. Laplacian operator is, of course, it's um, the sum of the second pure derivatives of an operator, and therefore it's the trace of the Hessian. So you are prescribing where's the trace of the Hessian, in a sense that you are saying that the trace is a prescribed object, mu, and with mu, um, we, we mean something that can be very general. Let me give, uh, for instance, mu can be an LP function from a Libex space, mu can be a smooth function, mu can be even a measure. But according to the classical approach in regularity theory, we start prescribing that mu is a C infinite function, but we never use its infi C infinite norm. So we give a priori estimates. We, we are just interested in a priori estimates. Then by approximation, if a priori estimates are good enough, then you can recover the results for the most general cases, even when mu is a measure. So OK, what's the basic, uh, uh, what's the, what are the basic results? OK, a basic result for Calder, from Calder and Zygmunt theory from the 50s is if mu belongs to LQ, then the second derivatives belong to LQ. So in some sense, you are converting the information you have on the, from the trace on the Hessian on the whole Hessian. So if the trace is in LQ, then the second derivatives are in LQ with an a priori estimate Then eventually allows you to, to pass to the limit. OK, this is true, of course, apart from the critical cases Q equal to 1 and Q is equal to infinity, where this fails to be to be true by counterexample. So this is true provided you are in good reflexive spaces. As soon as you go to borderline cases, this result um, is not true anymore. There are uh, weaker counterparts, but this is not true anymore. So this is the general spirit of the, of the talk. How can we extend, um, how can we get information on the regularity of solutions starting from information from the data? OK. And um, OK, uh, let me recall the classical strategy for solving uh, this problem and uh, proving this result. Uh, uh, of course, when you have the Poisson equation, this is a very favorable case because you can have an explicit representation formula on the solution in terms of the so-called Green's function. Uh, so therefore, you can commute your PD problem into an integral equation problem. And you can see that U is, the, is just the image of this operator. OK, what happens uh, is that the Green's function is this one. And therefore, after a couple of differentiations, you can get that the second derivatives can be represented by another integral operator. And now, uh, this integral operator is, is singular. Why is singular? Because you start by the original Green's function, which is this one, 
like x minus y, n minus 2. And let me recall you that you are in Rn. And just for simplicity, let me take the case n strictly larger than 2, so we avoid the logarithmic kernel. So when you, uh, when you start differentiating, then you, you differentiate twice. You see, this is an integrable kernel because this is just like 1 over x to the n minus 2, which is integrable as soon as this exponent, for instance, is less than n, around, uh, locally integrable, of course. Um, but now, what happens when you differentiate twice? When you differentiate twice, of course, you can bound the second derivatives by something which is like this guy. And this is very bad because the right-hand side is now not integrable anymore, you see? But now, the twist in the calderon sigmund theory is that you, uh, you do not want to get this rough estimate because the second, uh, the second derivatives exhibit cancellations. In a certain sense, this is what you teach to first-year students. If you have a, a quantity like a plus b, then there's a trivial estimate, which is this one. Okay, this is exactly the estimate you do not want to use here because you lose possible cancellations inside this. This is exactly the same thing you were saying in the previous talk. And so you have to analyze cancellations. When you analyze cancellations, you see that this kernel gives you an operator which is still treatable. In this part, if you consider its absolute value, then this becomes uh, really too large. So this is not the case that you can do. And so this is the core of calderon sigmund theory, analyze cancellations. And this is probably, historically speaking, the first time that this principle has been introduced in our analysis. And now this principle is nowadays more or less everywhere. Every time you have a critical problem, a critical problem is essentially where you have a quantity to estimate such that its absolute value is too much or you have a quantity like this, then you, you, you look for cancellations. And cancellations actually help being, in some sense, the surface of a, of a, larger, of a, a larger plethora of aspects of the problem. For instance, this you see in harmonic mappings, uh, this you see in um, all problems with critical growth. There are, there's a bunch of problems, a large class of problems that exhibit a critical growth in a sense that certain quantities appear not to be integrable, but they appear not to be integrable because you do estimates in absolute value like this. If you look closer and if you look at the nature of the problems, then cancellations appear, making exactly the, the results you expect or you hope for to, uh, to be true. Okay. Um, and, uh, okay, what's the general strategy? The general strategy is very simple. So you consider this operator, and this operator is well posed in L infinity. Uh, it's well posed in L2. Why? Because, uh, because as I told you, as I told you, this operator is bounded in uh, terms of absolute value in this way. So this means that when you pass to the Fourier transform, this is a good, very good uh, multiplier, and it's bounded, and therefore this is, uh, uh, this is well posed in L infinity essentially by Planchard theorem. So L, L2, uh, from L2 to L2, the situation is clear. You do not need things like uh, uh, T, T1 theorem or TB theorem by uh, Junet and Samson, whatever. These were eventually developed later, essentially when you do not have the initial tool. But then this is well posed. Then, and here is this uh, where you use can, uh, or mandel cancellations. You see that if you have a, a, an absolute value here, if you have an absolute absolute value here, you cannot uh, you cannot integrate. But if you consider if you consider this guy, then this is finite, and this is finite at every scale, as you can see. Uh, hilariously, Ormander and Calderon appeared not to be in very good terms, and this uh, um, this uh, nowadays uh, this. Um, cancellation condition is, uh, is called Ormander cancellation condition. That is uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, the way that Ormander restated certain cancellation conditions originally formulated by Calderon and Sigmund. Uh, essentially, this is Ormander revisitation of, of, um, of their theory. Okay, anyway, the proof uh, goes on in this way. If you send L2 into L2, and then, and then if you have this, these cancellation conditions, then LQ to LQ is, uh, is, an, is true. I mean, and therefore, you can reverse, you can reverse this into the solution of, uh, uh, from, of, your, of your original problem. 
And that's the proof. OK, if you are just interested in integrability conditions on the gradient or, or, in the, or U, then you can avoid this cancellation theory. You can just do exactly as I told you, because you can bound uh, the gradient by a so-called Ries kernel operator. It's a fractional operator. Because essentially, if you look here, if you look here, we have seen that U was the convolution GY, d mu y. So therefore, when you differentiate once, then you get the first derivative here. And you see if G grows as x to the n minus 2, then the first derivative can be bounded by this guy. Now, this is still integrable. And you do not need cancellation theory, analysis of cancellation. You go on directly for this operator. So you can bound. And uh, this I, I, would, I would suggest you to keep in mind, because we will several times uh, go back to Ries uh, operator in the following. And of course, uh, this is the Ries potential. Uh, the Ries potential operator as as long as beta is larger than 0. Uh, this is an integrable kernel, and everything is going is going fine, and therefore um, uh, this uh, this mapping property is known. Probably it goes back to Hardy Littlewood, and um, and then you can really go back uh, to the to the integrability properties of the gradient in terms of those of the measure mu or of the function mu, because uh, uh, essentially you now you now. Mm, reduce the analysis of the problem to the analysis of another operator. The, the operator is known, and therefore everything is known for the problem uh, as long as you are, for instance, considering the big space or rearrangement invariant function spaces. Uh, and this is essentially what I was saying before. When you go to singular integrals, you need cancellations. When you, and therefore, you need cancellations because you're looking for the maximal regularity of the solutions, the second derivatives. If you go to first derivative, uh, then you are not looking for maximal regularity. Therefore, you do not need cancellations. You, you, go, you go and just analyze the size properties of the kernel. Uh, OK, the same, thing, the same thing holds for this equation. For this equation, what's the result? For this equation, the result um, is the following one. And he says it, it is essentially equivalent. It is essentially equivalent to the result, uh, to the previous result. So you're, uh, you're uh, analyzing um, a right hand side, uh, which is in divergence form. OK, uh, let's do as first year calculus student do. OK, first year calculus student, engineering students would do. OK, they would write that the, diver the Laplacian is the divergence of the gradient. And uh, this is divergence of f. So the next thing typically students do is that they simplify divergence. After simplifying divergence, uh, you see that du is like f, and therefore you expect that the gradient is exactly where f is. OK, um, the result, it's true. And simplify divergence. That's what you want. That's what you're doing. Um, of course, the proof is completely wrong. But uh, this is what I would call dimensional analysis. And why it is true? Because at this stage, you go back to the usual representation formulas. And um, you go back to the usual representation formulas. And now, um, on the right hand side, you have the divergence of capital F. And then you have this guy. Now, you formally differentiate once, because you are interested in the gradient here. When you formally uh, uh, differentiate, you get something like g prime. And these are the first derivatives now. And now, you still see the divergence. You want to get rid of the divergence, because you want f, capital F, on the right hand side. So you integrate by parts. And this now appears as the second derivative of this guy. Second derivatives of g gives you, once again, a singular integral operator. And therefore, this is a calderon zygmunt type operator. And that gives you that the gradient is exactly where f is. And that's it. And that's the real proof, the real proof. Uh, the first proof, the basic calculus student proof, it's just dimensional analysis. And dimensional analysis usually works at the end. And it just gives you, at the beginning, where, uh, OK, an indication where you are pointing at. 
Okay, a subsequent approach, a very important approach has been given by two Italian mathematicians in the 60s, uh, that is Campagnato and Stampacchia, and they were still relying, uh, okay, they were not relying on representation formulas. This was the first time that this theory was avoided. They were not relying on representation formulas, but they were strongly relying on some dual approaches in some sense. They were using the linearity of the equation, and then they were using uh, irregularity estimates and some interpolation spaces. Um, okay, what Campagnato and uh, Stampacchia were doing, they were considering this problem. For instance, this is just an example, and they were considering the operator that to each f maps the gradient of u. This is obviously linear because everything is linear. So by testing the equation, and this is completely trivial, this gives uh, that the operator sends L2 into L2, and this is the analog of Planchard L. And then they showed that the operator sends L infinity into a space called BMO. BMO is not in L infinity, it's slightly larger than L infinity, and uh, actually the, this operator doesn't send L infinity, it doesn't send in L infinity into L infinity, this is true, but send, sends L infinity into BMO, which is still close enough to L infinity to allow for interpolation. And then they proved an abstract interpolation theorem that tells that uh, uh, an, uh, such an operator, such a linear or actually sublinear operator, uh, sends LQ into LQ. Okay, what is BMO? It, it is interesting to see what is BMO. BMO is the space of function such that this quantity is finite. So you take a, a function, then you define its average over a ball, BR, and this is uh, the average value of F over this ball. Then you take F, you subtract the average on each scale, and you prescribe that, uh, in some sense, the mean square deviation from F to its average you can also put two here, it's the same, but put one, then it's finite on every scale. Of course, uh, uh, of course this is uh, obviously uh, satisfied for every L infinity function, but this is, uh, requires less. And you see that once again, the idea of cancellations is shifted uh, from the problem, from the one singular kernel to the function space. It's a classical dual approach, but you still have to use cancellations. This is a, a, some sort of principle of conservations of ideas in mathematics, right? You, 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 you think that a basic idea, uh, you, can, you can get rid of a basic idea somewhere, and then the same idea pops up somewhere else. Here, the cancellations uh, uh, that you analyze on the kernel, they are shifted and incorporated in, 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 the, in the real definition of function spaces, and therefore you go for interpolation. Okay, this is as the linear case is, uh, is done. Okay, now, what the, um, now uh, the real, the, the real uh, stuff of my lecture starts, because now you want to reproduce as much as possible these results for nonlinear operators. And so in particular, I will analyze uh, possibly the generate quasi-linear operators of this type, divergence of A of the U equal to H. H is something that is going to be uh, now um, mm, uh, considered uh, to, be, um, to be in several different function spaces. Let's see. Okay, uh, possibly we will consider uh, vector-valued cases, so you can be even vector-valued in several cases. And uh, usually I will consider these assumptions. So these assumptions are classical after Lagiseska and Dura-Alceva and are suggested by the analysis of the uh, so-called Pilaplacian operator. The Pilaplacian operator is the following one. So you take du, and uh, this is the Pilaplacian operator, and this is the equations you are going to consider. So this is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if you consider the case P larger or equal than 2, and I will mostly reduce to this case just for simplicity, otherwise we have to distinguish uh, cases, but just, I just want to give a flavor of the basic ideas that are going to, to be around now. Uh, and then, for instance, you see that, uh, that this coincides with the Laplacian when P is equal to 2, and when P is larger than 2, this operator becomes degenerate when, for instance, DU approaches 0. So you lose the generation. And therefore, here you are prescribing exactly the same thing. You are prescribing that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that the first eigenvalue of the matrix goes like uh, z to the p minus 2, and the ellipticity that generates uh, exactly as the gradient to the p minus 2. This is a essentially a way to, uh, to make extrapolation on the basic assumptions you need on the operator. 
So uh, just to, for the case P larger than two, think of the P Laplacian operator. You don't, lose, you don't lose much in generality. Otherwise, for the case P equals to two, just think of any general divergence operator. And let me recall you now some, something which is very important for the following. Uh, here, the real point is passing from linear to nonlinear, not passing from linear to degenerate. Already the case P equals to two requires different things because the operators are not linear. So representations, formulas, interpolation approaches, sublinearity is ruled out completely. And then, of course, when you go for the generate um, operators, you, uh, you encounter even much more difficulties. But conceptually speaking, the real passage is from linear to nonlinear. So already the case P equals to two requires um, uh, almost the full strength of the methods. Okay. Um, and therefore, this is, a, this is what I was saying before. This is the P Laplacian operator. Uh, the P Laplacian operator, of course, uh, pops up everywhere. For instance, it, this is the Euler-Lagrange equation of a function like this. It's the simplest function that you, may, you might consider. Then it pops up in the linear fluid dynamics in a wide range of situations. So, okay, this is well known. So let's stick to these kinds of operators. Okay, and then the classic, okay, what do we mean by a solution? We start by a basic distributional solution. So we take, uh, we take the equation, we formally integrate by part, by parts this equation. We formally integrate by parts and we get this um, distributional formulation that initially is tested only by C infinity functions. And this is, of course, the weakest possible formulation. This is a real crucial point because when you pass from linear to nonlinear, the wider is the range of functions you are putting there, the less regularity you expect on the solution. The more regularity, sorry, you expect on the solution. If you restrict to very, to very uh, smooth functions, you expect less regularity on the solution because the solution, uh, in a way, is allowed to have more oscillations because you are testing with less test functions. Okay, the basic issues are now where we can take here, for instance, phi proportional to u. Why this is so important? Because uh, you want to use ellipticity, therefore you want to use energy estimates, and therefore if you want to have estimates on the solution itself, you want to uh, use the ellipticity of the equation, and therefore you want to use something which is at least proportional to u or to some powers of u. This is the first basic issue. A second issue is where do you find a solution? Because you see, the P Laplacian operator, for instance, uh, uh, is the uh, is, um, um, okay, is, is, is an operator stemming from this functional. And of course, the natural space where you want to consider this functional is W1P, that's a subtle space of functions with distributional derivatives in LP. Okay, so the, the natural energy space associated to the problem is W1P. Can you really find W1P solutions? Uh, we will see that in general this is false if the right-hand side is not good enough. And the two things are actually related. Why? Because assume that you have a function in W1P. Then it is easy to see by the growth conditions imposed on this operator that this defines an element of the dual. Therefore, by duality, this is equal to H, and therefore H is in the dual of W1P. On the other hand, if H is in the dual of W1P, you can apply standard monotonicity methods, like for instance, minty broder theorem, and minty broder theorem gives you back with the W1P solution. So in general, the paradigm uh, of these problems gives you now um, uh, uh, a two-fold way, right? A two-folded way. Uh, the first is when the right-hand side belongs to the dual. And there you find the W1P solution. On the contrary, uh, if, uh, um, okay, conversely, if, if, if you have a W1P solution by growth conditions, the right hand side is automatically in the dual. So this we call the energy case. So in the energy case, you are dealing with W1P solutions and then you can hope for further regularity. Then there is the other case. This is not in the dual. So you cannot apply standard monotonicity methods. You have to apply different things. And in general, the solution is not in W1P. This is called a very weak solution. So solutions that do not belong 
to W and P are called very weak solutions. And they can be very pathological. So uh, the presentation now is going to follow in two, in two parts. Uh, energy solutions, W1P solutions, that is, W1P solutions, and then very weak, weak solutions. So I will start by uh, uh, energy solutions. And of course, uh, immediately, you see immediately that by density, once again by the growth properties of this operator, then if you have a W1P solution, then you can test this identity by W1P functions. In particular, you can test by U, and then you can go on getting energy estimates, or so-called Cacioppoli estimates. These are the basic estimates that uh, are the starting point for all the regularity um, for all the regularity problems uh, in, uh, in the theory, and these are also called Cacioppoli estimates. Renato Cacioppoli was a Neapolitan mathematician who was working on this stuff in the 30s or in the 40s. Um, okay. And, uh, but on the other hand, you see, if you look at this weak formulation, that's what I was saying, uh, you see that this guy grows as due to the p minus 1. And if you just confine yourself to, uh, to use C infinity test functions, you can see that you can do that the problem makes sense because this is integrable now, right? And of course, uh, now you are allowing for very few test functions, and now you are allowing also for very weak solutions, and that's why very weak solutions turn, turn out to be more irregular, because they satisfy the equation, they satisfy an identity, only for a very restricted set of test functions. They are very smooth, and therefore they are not good enough to compensate all the possible oscillations of the solutions. That's the real delicate point of testing. If you test for very smooth functions, they cannot have micro, very bad micro oscillations that usually, as you know from harmonic analysis, they can cancel the micro oscillations of the other, of the other object. Okay, in fact, very weak solutions do exist. And now I will concentrate just on the, on the, on the uh, energy solutions. So the next part of the talk is about uh, energy solutions. We have seen that when you have energy solutions, then the right-hand side belongs to uh, the dual of W1P. And by a general representation theorem, you do not lose generality in getting a right-hand side, in considering a right-hand side of this type. So you can, in some sense, always rewrite uh, the dual as in, in this form. OK, I can provide details after all, uh, but uh, we will consider uh, in this case, uh, we will consider this case because it's actually uh, more pleasant from a purely aesthetical point of view. And you do not lose generality. So we go back, in particular, in the linear case, uh, to the case uh, considered originally by Calder and Zygmunt theory and by um, uh, and by Campanato and Stampacchia, yeah. that's the divergence form. In particular, when p is equal to 2. And now, uh, the first basic result that actually marks the beginning of what we could, we could call nonlinear Calder and Zygmunt theory is a very fundamental result by Tadeo Shivanez that states exactly what you expect. Cancel the divergence, simplify the divergence, erase it, and then the gradient is exactly where f is. That's why I put the right-hand side form in this way. It's easier and it's more, I mean, uh, um, it, it's more easy to, to, to explain the result. But remember that you have to start from something which is in W1P, in the dual of W1P, and therefore this estimates, because the, the result, of course, comes uh, along with uh, an a priori estimate, which is which can be both local and global. The original result is in our end, but you can localize as well. Uh, and then this tells that uh, the gradient is exactly where capital, capital F is. And this is sharp. You cannot get better, of course. Uh, but you cannot go be, uh, below W1P. OK, uh, the next result, uh, this result has been extended uh, um, to the case of the, the P Laplacian system because uh, Tadeusz um, originally proved it uh, um, 
uh, for equations, but extending uh, Tadeusz's ideas, uh, Di Benedetto and Manfredi, who are very strong experts in regularity theory too, they extended to catch this case. F is in BMO, then DO is in BMO. And this is a very um, a nice borderline case. Of course, F, L, F L infinity, DO in L infinity is false, already in the case P equal to 2. This is the best you can do. Uh, okay, and then Caffarelli and Peral, uh, okay, uh, Caffarelli and Peral gave another approach, a very important approach, um, to the same uh, to the same uh, problem, actually in a, in a related field in homogenization theorem, and then um, uh, Lee Wang extended Caffarelli and Peral to get, uh, approach to get to get another proof. Uh, I think it's interesting to see a sketch of the ideas of uh, of Tadeusz of Tadeusz proof. And I would like to say that both these approaches, which are somehow different, they have, uh, they have common points, but they are uh, different. They are based on the use of maximal operators. In particular, Tadeusz is using the so-called Pfefferman and Stein sharp maximal operator. That is, you do consider um, for functions, the soup of all these guys over all the scales centered at x, and this defined a sharp maximal operator of f at x. And the classical adelaide maximal operator that is defined as follows. Then you take the average, and then you take the soup over all averages centered at x. OK, uh, let me give you a sketch of the ideas of Tadeusz uh, that is also um, interesting. So in the classical proof, in the linear proof, what do you do? You have two, uh, you have two cases. You have two steps. First representation formula, convolution. Representation formulas. And then analysis of singular integrals. So Tadeusz approach. Um, you bypass this. So Tadeusz, what he does, he replaces the local representation formula by a comparison argument that is e, e, he takes all possible poles, and then he takes the so-called p-harmonic lifting. So he solves this, this problem. On the boundary. Why this is good? Because solutions of these guys are at least Lipschitz, actually, are C1 alpha. He uses C1 alpha, but you can, eh? Oh, zero, <laughs> the p-harmonic lifting. And uh, solutions, in particular, they are C1-alpha. In particular, they are Lipschitz. Caffarelli and Peral, they use their, uh, its Lipschitz. Uh, Tadeusz uses C1-alpha. But the important thing is that you use that it's better. It's already in the best possible case you want to be. And uh, in particular, they um, satisfy, and this is, for instance, Caffarelli and Peral approach, the so-called L-infinity L1 estimate. This is the double ball. Uh, sorry, half of the ball, the same ball. So you can bound the L infinity norm by the L1. If you look at better, what is this? Is 1 over R to the n. So this is a local representation formula. So you replace, you replace the, local, the global representation formula with local ones. Then, of course, you have to repatch it everything. And how do you do? This is, in the linear case, the analysis of uh, of a singular operator. Here, you do not have singular operators because you have decomposed the problem. You have scattered all these balls around, so you have to patch them out. And how do you do? You use maximal operators because maximal operators, they are related to uh, singular integrals. So therefore, um, you do not use anymore the proof of Calderon Sigmund, but in some sense, you are reshuffling the ideas. So uh, the, the representation formula is replaced by local a priori estimates. And uh, um, uh, singular integrals are replaced by maximal operators. So cancellations are always flowing around. And this was the problem. 
OK, Dan Krilov, um, in a series of papers, gives yet another approach, uh, which is closer to the one of Tadeusz. And then there's a sequence of authors who, uh, who gave contributions, Byung, Ding, uh, Dining, Dong, Gutierrez, and uh, also other people, including myself. And um, these, are the, uh, these are the beginnings. OK, Ivanet's results extends to equations of general type, because essentially what you're using of the PL Plasian operator is the possibility of getting a local, a local a priori estimates, and they work. They, in fact, work for general uh, equations. And in fact, you can, you can prove it. You can reprove everything for general equations. Uh, the proof goes on verbatim. And the analysis uh, goes under the assumptions I told you before, and there is no problem in that. Um, Ivanian's result does not extend to systems. Uh, why? Because it cannot, because there, there are counterexamples. When you go to general systems, uh, you see that even when the right-hand side is zero, you can use, uh, you can find examples of unbounded solutions. Here, uh, the result would tell you that you would be almost in a Lipschitz case. But uh, there are unbounded solutions, and just because systems are not regularizing operators. When you go to systems, the spreading of coordinates gives you, allows for a formation of singularities for very basic topological reasons. Uh, it, it, it still holds uh, for special systems, uh, systems uh, with so-called quasi-diagonal structure, where the, the nonlinearity is just, um, let's say, a multiplier of the diagonal. Because for these systems, regularity theory holds, and this, this estimates they still hold. These are Uhlenbeck type systems. OK. Uh, and then this was the result of, uh, this was the result of Ivanets. And uh, these results, they go back to 85, 86. And of course, you want to start now the, uh, to analyze the parabolic version of these problems. Because of course, there's also a parabolic version of the linear theory. And you would like to go to the parabolic case. OK, in the parabolic case, the result uh, has remained an open problem since 85, 80, um, 86. Why? Because now we have, to go, we, have to go, we have to go to the technique, and you see that the technique fails. Why? Because the, uh, the, the, the real thing that makes this local a priori estimate to be closer to a representation formula is, a, is that it is homogeneous. You see, gradient to the power of one here, gradient to the power of one, and then you pass from an average to a pointwise information. But it is homogeneous. For these operators, what, what is the estimate? Let me just consider the case p larger than two for simplicity. The estimate is unfortunately the following one. L infinity, and then you go on a parabolic cylinder, and then you still have uh, a certain power here, p, then you would expect to have p here. And this would be perfect, but this is false. This is false because you still have p over 2 here. So you have a, um, uh, a gap, a gap in the estimate. This is the deficit scaling coefficient of the equation. And you cannot get better. Why? Because the equation, even in the most simple case, which is the zero right hand side, the homogeneous one. That's the equation. Even in this simple case, is not homogeneous. Because if you multiply u by a constant, this doesn't solve a sim the same equation. This happens for the P Laplacian, but it doesn't happen for this case. Why? Because there are two parts here. This case like 1, and this case like globally p minus 1. If you, when you test, this 1 becomes 2, this becomes p, and that's the origin of the factor p over 2. So this makes the whole technique, uh, the, the elliptic technique, break down. And therefore, the problem remained open for, uh, uh, for more than 20 years until we were able to solve it in, uh, in 2005. Actually, the paper appeared later. And uh, we proved exactly the same result, but with a completely different technique. Um, 
let me show, let me observe that this object, this exponent is always less than two. So you catch the case p larger than two fully. And uh, when you go uh, to the case p less than two, you cannot avoid this because otherwise, even in the homogeneous case, the result is false because there are unbounded solutions. Okay, it is maybe worth spending a few words on this result and on the related technique we developed to achieve it, uh, because this is, as far as I know, uh, the first time in this setting that you completely avoid the harmonic analysis tools. So we had uh, an harmonic analysis free, proof of this estimate. In turn, when you evolve this to the linear case, you get harmonic analysis free, direct proof also for linear cases. Uh, of course, I'm cheating because uh, using harmonic analysis doesn't tell that you are using only the tools, but you can have, use also ideas. And this is like the ghost, right? Like in the, this John Giovanni, you get rid of the commendator at the beginning and then the statue comes at the end. <laughs> Uh, okay, but actually, no, no use of maximal operators whatsoever is used. You have to cook up a direct proof. And the direct proof passes through the analysis of so-called Di Benedetto intrinsic geometry. And uh, let me spend a few words on this. Okay, the real point as I told you before, is that uh, a priori estimates for this problem are not homogeneous. They have a deficit scaling. So you have P here and you have one half here. And that's the end of the story if you want to use the previous technique. So you want to readjust uh, the analysis in order to get a priori estimates which are homogeneous and therefore they are the ghosts of the missing singular uh, okay, representation formulas. Okay, what do you do? Uh, okay, the analysis is the following. So you wonder why this equation is not homogeneous and you start uh, with a simple case equal to zero, right hand side equal to zero. So uh, the idea of the Benedetto's intrinsic geometry is the following one, you do not only consider parabolic cylinders. So parabolic cylinders are those guys that are rho in space and rho squared in time, and you add a rho squared to compensate the lack of one derivative here. But uh, they are corrected, they are fertilely corrected in another way. They are uh, cylinders of this type. This is 2 minus p. What is lambda? Okay, let me call this cylinder Q lambda rho. What is this uh, uh, lambda? Well, you assume that uh, on the same cylinder, the gradient is like lambda. And you do it uh, making an average condition on the same cylinder, saying uh, that here is like lambda. And the word intrinsic exactly stems from this fact, that lambda appears both on the left and the right hand side here. That's make the whole condition to be very intrinsic. Okay, and now assume that you can do this. Assume that you can find such cylinders. Now, in, on such cylinders, what happens? It happens that du is like lambda. Okay, if du is like lambda, this is lambda to the p minus two. So this approaches the heat equation, because this is this guy. But now you do a change of variable, and you stretch the time of lambda to the 2 minus p, and therefore, this becomes the heat equation on the cylinder q11. And therefore, for the heat equation, you have homogeneous estimates. So you have to decompose the level sets of the solution using not standard uh, balls, but intrinsic balls. And this makes the whole thing difficult. So you select a level, and then you cover this level with intrinsic balls, and then you proceed with an analysis that mimics the maximal proof, but does not use the maximal operator, because there's no maximal operator associated to this ball. You have the universal maximal operator, but this is not good enough. It's not regularizing enough. Um, okay, why it is, you, it is natural to consider such, uh, such conditions? First of all, you see it yourself, because on an intrinsic cylinder, the P-Laplacian operator, evolutionary operator, becomes, in some sense, as the heat equation. 
Uh, but this also tells you one thing. You are interested when the gradient is large. So what happens when the gradient is large? That the diffusion becomes very large because lambda becomes very large. And therefore, you just need less time to regularize because you're spreading the heat faster. So everything fits in this analysis. So if the gradient is very large, the diffusion coefficient of the equation is very large. And therefore, the heat is spreading faster and faster. And you need less time to achieve the same spreading of the heat you would otherwise achieve in Q1 in the, let's say, unit basic, basic unit time. And therefore, uh, you can reduce, you can solve this problem in it this way. Uh, these are the basic steps. Of course, you can go for general equations. You have to use the Benedetto's results. And uh, the method produces a purely PV proof. No tools from harmonic analysis, as I told you. We just use some ideas, inspiring ideas from harmonic analysis, but no tools. Essentially, maximal operators have now disappeared. This is a maximal operator proof free, free proof. Um, new interpolation free proof of classical Calderon sequence, and in particular, uh, I think you can go to a more elementary proof of these Caffarelli estimates uh, for full linear linear. I think there was a PhD student somewhere who was working on them. And in particular, if you want to go back to the proof of this classical result, you can give a very one page proof that uses just two, uh, two, um, two ingredients Vitalis covering lemma and uh, mean value properties of harmonic functions. So you <laughs> just go back one century before. But you can really do it now in one line. So no interpolation, no Marcinkiewicz interpolation, uh, no weak estimates whatsoever. You just go for integrals, coverings, and mean, mean value properties. I guess that this was very known before. Uh, but uh, I, mean, I mean, all the tools, mean value properties and Vitalis covering theorems were very known for a long while. But now this new way of recombining, you can do actually a very fast proof, even for undergraduate students this way. Uh, it's never written anywhere, but uh, you can recover. You can recover using reading the proof. Um, OK, let me now turn to, towards the, the, the end of the lecture. And of course, you see that uh, now we go back to the other case. The other case is exactly the subdual case where the right hand side doesn't belong to the dual of W1P. And in fact, it doesn't belong if you uh, prescribe that capital F is not lying in LP, but just in LQ. Which Q you can prescribe? Those Q making all these, uh, in some sense, uh, integrable and uh, considerable when you test by C infinite functions. So the equation is this one. The weak formulation of the equation is this one, p minus 2 du d phi equals f p minus 2 f d phi. d phi is now bounded. So you just have to prescribe that the right hand side f belongs to LQ, and Q is larger than p minus 1. Actually, to give everything meaning, you prescribe that uh, Q is larger or equal than p minus 1, but you already know in the linear case that when Q is larger, then p is equal to, Q, uh, to 2. And therefore, Q is equal to 1, the result doesn't hold. Uh, so the open problem, and this is a very, very hard open problem. This is a Fields Medal level open problem. Eh? Because uh, if you solve this, then there's a whole circle of things uh, coming up. Uh, including the sharp estimates for the Berlin transform. And uh, I strongly recommend you to uh, read the survey papers of Tadeusz Shivanitz, who is really a master in these things. Um, actually, he's not only a master, he's the guy who started the whole, uh, the whole viewpoint. And uh, of course, this is a range of values for which the problem, uh, it makes sense, for which it makes sense to consider the problem. And uh, essentially, for what I wrote you before, because it makes uh, everything integrable. And then you would like to, to know if the same result holds. And the only result I know uh, was uh, proved independently by Ivanets as Bordone um, in, the, in this paper. And then uh, there was also another approach. I think it was completely independent, but it was with different a priori estimates by John Lewis. This tells you that you can do that, but you can do when you move slightly around W1P. So you are not in W1P, but you are not too far from W1P. So there exists a universal epsilon 
such that if you move around a bit W1P, then you still have the estimate. Otherwise, the problem is solved. You would like, in other words, to turn epsilon into one, at least for the Pilaplacian operator. That's the original conjecture. This result holds for every possible equation. And uh, there are two proofs here, uh, essentially Vanyets and Bourdonge and uh, Lewis proof. They are both very much interesting, and in particular, the, the parabolic version of this case, you can achieve extending Lewis proof, and this was done by Kinunen. And uh, Kinunen appears for the, say, for the second time in two talks here, so he gives, uh, he gives very important contributions. And in particular, the second, the second paper is a very, very uh, technically demanding paper. It's a very difficult and technically involved. Um, so that's the status, that's the open problem, and um, uh, there's no time enough, right? No. Yeah. Two or three minutes. Okay, uh, let me recall the basic strategy of Tadeo Shivanez and Carlos Bourdon, eh? because I think it's very interesting, it's a very interesting tool. John Lewis uses uh, truncation and extension of maximal operators. Ivanez and Bourdon um, use another method, that's the nonlinear stability. That's the nonlinear stability of Hodge decomposition. Okay, what's the point here? Uh, you cannot test the equation because the with the solution because the gradient is not in LP. So the gradient is not in LP. Now, you have a very weak solution because this is related to very weak solutions, so you start considering very weak solutions. So how, what do you do to improve the integrability of the gradient? Uh, the mass, and to be still parallel to the gradient. You take the gradient and you divide by a small power of its modulus, and therefore you say, oh, I test with this guy. Unfortunately, this guy is not a gradient. It's not a gradient. Uh, so, Hodge decomposition tells that this is a gradient plan plus something uh, divergent, um, plus something uh, curl free. And uh, this you can always do, but then how to control this guy? And the real stability proved by Ivanets and Bordone, and previously by Ivanets with a longer proof, but the proof of Ivanets and Bordone uses uh, um, some interpolation estimates, some interpolation ideas, and Schwarz lemma, is that uh, still you can control this guy, the norm of this guy, with something which is proportional to epsilon, the right norm of this guy. So, in other words, when epsilon goes to zero, this is the standard object decomposition for which you have estimates. Also, when epsilon is small, this is not very far from what you are at the beginning. And therefore, for epsilon small, you can reabsorb these terms and getting a priori estimates. That's why, that's why the, the smallness of epsilon comes from. Um, this is the end of the talk, and I usually finish my talks with a picture of a friend of mine who is saying, I know, and she's an artist working in Venice. She's a good friend of mine, and I usually finish all my talks with a, with a picture of saying, Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>